Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Ever since I was a young boy, I've always been absolutely fascinated with computers and technology. And because I grew up in the 80s, I was very much part of the computer, the microcomputer revolution. And what that meant was I was able to get my hands on wonderfully powerful computers like the ZX81, 1K of memory, and some of you might remember the uh, rubbery keyboard, Speccy 48K. Now, what was fantastic for us at the time was with these computers, we were actually able to program. And up to that point, we were used to things like the Atari machines where you stick a cartridge in the machine, but you couldn't actually program the device. And for the first time, we were actually able to code. And if you actually look on the keys here, each of the individual keys is a function. And we were able to experiment with computer graphics, playing computer games. And we thought this was fantastic. We thought the graphics that we were producing were second to none. We thought they were incredibly realistic. And if you're playing a computer game and suddenly a monster pops up, you're thinking, wow, that's, that's quite cool, very realistic. Well, of course, you know what? It wasn't. It wasn't that good. But the years passed by, of course, and computers became more and more powerful. And, of course, the cost of computers has come right down as well. And that's primarily because of the games industry. It's the games industry which has really pushed the, uh, the specification of these computers up and brought the prices down. Now, in the uh, early 90s, I somehow managed to get myself into university to study computer science and computer graphics, and a topic then called virtual environments. And virtual environments is really the, the posh word for virtual reality. And while I was studying uh, computer science, I came across, I was doing some research, and I came across this young researcher from the 60s called Ivan Sutherland. And Ivan Sutherland, really blew my mind because the work that he was doing back in the 60s was second to none. He is the, the godfather of computer graphics. He developed the first CAD systems. But more interestingly for me is his pioneering work with helmet-mounted displays. Bear in mind this is back in the 60s. Now for those of you that don't know what a helmet-mounted display is, it's, in essence it's a device that you put on your head and the computer can control the left eye image and the right eye image, and therefore you can be immersed within another environment. Of course, seeing in 3D or stereoscopic uh, visualization isn't necessarily a new thing. In fact, uh, this stereoscopic viewer here, which I bought on eBay, um, is actually from 1850s. And by placing these antique stereoscopic cards onto the projection device, you can focus it and see fantastic um, antique stereoscopic photos from the late 19th century in beautiful 3D. But Ivan's work, Ivan was the start of the HMD, and his pioneering work um, was sort of summarized in a paper that he wrote called The Ultimate Display. And in his concluding uh, paragraph within this paper that he wrote in the 60s, he said that the ultimate display would, of course, be a room where the computer can control the existence of matter. A chair displayed in such a room would be good enough to sit in. Handcuffs displayed in such a room would be confining, and a bullet displayed in such a room would be fatal. With appropriate programming, such a device would literally be the wonderland into which Alice walked. And this was back in the 60s. Okay, so this guy, way ahead of his time, absolutely ahead of his time, and of course this, device here is the great, 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 great grandfather of what we're used to today, the HMDs of today. So now, of course, the field of views have increased, the resolutions have improved, latencies have been improved, and we're now able to really immerse people within computer-generated environments. However, it's great to have fantastic hardware, it's great to have really good software, but actually, do you know what? It's all about the content. The content is absolutely crucial. And the work that we do at the Glasgow School of Art, in collaboration with our colleagues at Historic Scotland, we focus on creating very accurate three-dimensional models of environments, for example, heritage sites. And if we want to do that, we want accuracy. And if we want accuracy, we're going to use a laser scanner. Now, a laser scanner 
this device here on the tripod, is a device which fires a laser very rapidly and it rotates around its vertical axis. And at the same time, special mirrors on the device will change the pitch of the laser. So it literally scans like this. And when the laser returns off the object of interest, we can pick that up on the laser scanner and therefore the device will calculate a point in three-dimensional space with x, y, z. And we can do that very, very quickly, about a million times a second. And of course, as you can imagine, that means we end up with a lot of data points. And those data points become a data cloud or a point cloud. And here we can see Rosalind Chapel. This is just the data points. It's been cleaned up a little bit. But it gives you an idea of what we're able to do. It's extremely accurate, sub-millimeter accurate. So let me tell you about a project called the Scottish 10 Project. This is uh, in collaboration with Historic Scotland again. And our goal really is the digital documentation of heritage sites for the benefit of future generations. And if you imagine if we can digitally document accurately a heritage site, then we can share it with people from all around the world. So for example, you might not be able to visit a heritage site because geographically it's on the other side of the world. Or maybe it's too dangerous for you to visit. Or perhaps the people that own the site don't want you to visit the site because the very act of you visiting the site can, can damage the site. So by creating permanent digital records of these sites, we're able to create these really immersive three-dimensional environments. So along with Historic Scotland, we scanned in five um, international sites and five sites within, within Scotland. Here, you can see those ones and, and World Heritage Sites, um, including Mount Rushmore, Ranikavav, uh, Tombs in India, Sydney Opera House, and a, a crane in Nagasaki. And I'm just going to talk about a couple of those projects. So the Mount Rushmore site, again, remember we want an accurate three-dimensional model of this site. We're using the laser scanner, so we literally had to abseil down the presidential heads in Mount Rushmore with the laser scanner, which is, which is very heavy. And we did this multiple times, took a number of weeks, and then that's how we can start to create this three-dimensional model. And this, on the left here, you can see this slight anomaly here. This is actually someone abseiling down who's been caught in the, in the laser scanner. So by taking multiple scans, we're then able to put all that scan data together in order to create our three-dimensional three -dimensional point cloud. And then you give this data to experts in the field of computer graphics. They can turn the points into polygons. And then, of course, we can do lighting calculations, and we can start to develop a photorealistic model. This isn't a drone flight. This is our computer model. And of course, because it's our computer model, I can put the camera anywhere I want. Okay, what would it be like to fly around Mount Rushmore and go to any point in space? Now you can do it. And of course, I've, I've been talking about the helmet-mounted displays from earlier. You know, when you embed that three-dimensional model and use display technology like the HMDs I showed you earlier, you can literally fly around anywhere you wanted to. And also, by taking high-resolution digital photography, we can projection map that onto the geometry and get extremely accurate data. So you can see uh, on Roosevelt's moustache here, you can see the actual hammer marks of the drill. That's how accurate the model is. Let's look at another model here. This is a, a, a step well, a royal step well in Gujarat in northern India. And this step well was built around 1020 AD. And it filled up with silt. And it was kind of rediscovered in the 1950s. And all the silt was removed to reveal seven layers or seven tiered step well, 20 meters deep. Absolutely beautiful world heritage site. And what makes it even more incredible is it has these beautiful, ornate, intricate carvings of Hindu deities that surround the well. And of course, it was very important for us to try and capture that within our three-dimensional model. So the laser scanning began. Again, this is in, in collaboration with our colleagues at Historic Scotland. And by creating a special sort of cantilever system and mounting of the laser scanner, we were able to push it over the site. You can imagine a lot of this work is extremely dangerous as well. Abseiling down the Mount Rushmore or this well, which is extremely deep. So we have to be very, very careful. And then here we can start to see the laser scan. 
there's a cross section, and of course here we can see our digital models. And what you have now is a permanent digital record of that site. Again, now we can actually fly around the data to any area we want to. Remember that we can do this using non-immersive techniques like you're experiencing now, or we can use helmet-mounted displays, or large projections where, where you wear special glasses and see in full 3D. Now, some people have actually said that this computer-generated model is actually better than the real thing. And the reason they're saying that is because if you go to the step well, you're fixed to the planar surface that you're standing on. And then the area of interest might be a statue that's 20 meters up in the air. But of course, with this, you can fly to any point in the three-dimensional model and interact with it. Also, we're able to overlay extremely high-resolution photography again directly onto the geometry, and that makes it extremely difficult to differentiate between the three-dimensional model and the real-life heritage site. Now, everything I've discussed so far has been focusing on the uh, specific sites. But of course, we can actually visualize events as well. And one event I'd like to talk to you about is the Battle of Bannockburn. The Battle of Bannockburn, of course, was a historic win for the Scottish over the English in 1314. And this is work for the National Trust of Scotland. And if you actually go to the um, Battle of Bannockburn Center, you'll be able to see some of this work. This is work again with Historic Scotland, and we work very closely with a company called Bright White, who were the designers. Of course, we need three-dimensional models of uh, our warriors, our fighters. So we just scanned in our own staff at the DDS. And working very closely with academics, we were able to create three-dimensional models of all the different types of warriors that we would have, all the different soldiers. And the academics who were experts in the weaponry, in the chain mail, in the leathers, everything, all the detail, and we were able to model all of that. And consequently, we were able to develop a three-dimensional database, extremely accurate three-dimensional database, of all the different attire and weaponry of what was used at the time. And this is a first. This hasn't been done before. For example, the gauntlets, the, the visors, and the chain mount. Now, what you have is you do have a very accurate three-dimensional model of a character, but what you don't have is the actual fighting motion. You don't have any accurate natural motion. And in the old days, Walt Disney would draw keyframes of animation. But nowadays, we can use motion capture. So by having experts in medieval martial arts, the chap on the left, Charlie, was actually in the film Gladiator. And here at work, we were able to record him uh, using these special markers. We can record all his natural fighting motion. And then we can directly link that and apply that to the three-dimensional models that you've seen earlier. Now, there's a famous point in the uh, Battle of Bannockburn when a young English knight sees the Scottish king, Robert the Bruce, and he charges him. He wants to kill him and finish the battle quickly. And at the last second, Robert the Bruce sidesteps him and puts an axe into his head. And in order for us to do that, we had our English knight here, and all we had to do was just hit him in the head with an axe albeit a sponge axe, boom, there we go. Okay, and of course, all that motion is then captured and then applied directly onto our three-dimensional models. And I can assure you that no one was hurt badly in any of, the, in any of this filming. Okay, so let's put, let's put all, this back to, all this together now. And now we can see our natural motion. We can see our realistic uh, faces that you'll see in a second. You'll see the actual correct fighting sequences, the right lighting. And of course, remember that all this can be visualized in virtual reality. You can put yourself anywhere you wanted to within that battle. And as I said, if you go to the Battle of Bannockburn Center in Stirling, you'll be able to experience this in true 3D. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'm really saying here is that it's really the time has come, the time has arrived now for virtual reality and computer graphics. In the next couple of months, there's going to be a whole plethora of helmet-mounted displays coming onto the market, not for us as researchers, but for us as the general public to consume. And I think finally, we are now able to experience the wonderland into which Alice walked. Thank you. <laughs>